Hello, everyone. It's one o'clock. We're going to get started with today's webinar. It's exciting to have so many of you joining us for today's topic. And we'd like to welcome you to the University of Maine Cooperative Extension Preserving the Maine Harvest webinar. <clears throat> I'm Kathy Savoy, and I will be joined today by my colleague, Kate McCarty, in the demo kitchen. And this webinar is designed to provide you with the most current USDA recommendations for preserving foods at home. Our monthly features, um, our monthly webinars feature seasonal foods that correspond with our main growing cycle. And we'll save all the jokes about our weather patterns that we've been having um, for later. But at any rate, we're gonna talk about fermenting foods today. So our organization is um, the University of Maine Cooperative Extension, and we exist to help people, Maine people, improve their lives through research-based education that's focused on issues and needs. Our educational programs include many that you're familiar with, like agriculture, horticulture, including the Master Gardener program, 4-H, youth development, food safety, nutrition, and of course, food preservation, what you're here to learn about today. So we are um, also want to let you know that the University of Maine is prohibited from discriminating on the basis of race, color, national origin, sex, age, disability, and reprisal or retaliation for prior civil rights activities. And today uh, we will focus on making fermented cucumber pickles. We're gonna share an overview of the fermenting process, tips for creating the highest quality um, fermented pickles, and how to troubleshoot anything that might go wrong. So now for some housekeeping, we are um, running our webinar today with me at the helm doing advancing the slides and Kate in the demonstration kitchen. And we'd love to have you ask some questions as we go along. Please put those right in the Q&A box, which is shown um, on this slide. And you can find that on your Zoom um, tab that you're watching us through. So again, questions should go right to the Q&A box. So let's get started with today's topic, fermenting pickles. So first we're gonna take a look at kind of the science behind fermenting and how it actually preserves your food. So fermenting is known as a curing process and it involves soaking vegetables in brine for several days or even weeks. Fermentation also produces lactic acid to help preserve the food. The curing process changes the color, the flavor, and the texture of the food. You can see in the slide that's shown some of those color changes that we're talking about. And the acid, lactic acid, is created naturally as the lactobacillus family of bacteria, which are naturally present on vegetables, are converting the sugars in vegetables to lactic acid. What this lactic acid does is alter the pH. The pH of the brine drops, making it harder for spoilage organisms such as molds, yeasts, and bacteria to grow. So fermentation not only produces those characteristic pickled flavors we love, as well as the crunch factor, but it's also creating a safe environment to preserve our food as well. Next, we're gonna to start to talk about some of the ingredients that are important to making sure you end up with a quality product. First up, we're gonna talk about salt. So um, when fermenting pickles, the brine is just a mixture of salt, water, and those spices that you use to get the great flavor profile you're familiar with, let's say a kosher dill. 
It also includes a small amount of vinegar to prevent pathogens from growing in those initial stages of fermentation. It's kind of like a little safety net. So let's discuss salt. We've got some pictures up here of salts and canning and pickling salt is of course what's recommended for use in pickling, including the fermentation of pickles. It is a pure granulated salt. It does not have any of those additives you may be familiar with like an anti-caking agent um, or iodine that can cause your brine to turn cloudy or your pickles, the cucumbers themselves, to darken. Iodine can also interfere with the fermentation process. Other salts like um, sea salts, kosher salts, um, they don't tend to have additives either but they can measure differently. Take a look at this slide here and you can see how much um, size variation there is in the, um, the crystals of the salt. And that can actually alter the um, measuring of your salt and cause undersalted pickles, which in the long run can be problematic. So not using the right amount of salt, again, can be a safety concern as the salt is, is really part of that whole formula, if you will, for making fermentation happen the way we want it to happen. The salty solution helps to suppress the growth of the unwanted pathogens before the bacteria produce enough lactic, lactic acid to keep those pathogens at bay. So the correct amount of salt in your brine will prevent unwanted molds, yeast, and bacteria from forming, which again can ultimately ruin a whole batch of fermented products. So do not use less salt than what is recommended or don't use reduced sodium salt in your fermented pickles as it may create an unsafe environment for fermenting foods. If you add too much um, salt, it can prevent any bacteria from growing, including the lactobacillus um, that we've talked about. And so fermentation may not occur with too much salt being added to the product as well. So next up for ingredients is water. Uh, water is an important part of that brine. So let's talk a little bit about that, particularly hard water. Hard water can give your pickles off colors and flavors. So if you do have hard water, you're gonna wanna soften it by boiling it for 15 minutes and then letting it stand for 24 hours. If any mineral sediment develops at the bottom of the pot, pour the water off and leave that sediment, which is those minerals behind. You don't wanna get those into your, your brine solution. Another issue with water can be chlorinated water. So if you are on a municipal water supply, you may have chlorinated water that can in fact prevent fermentation from occurring. So to um, kind of off gas that chlorine, you'll want to um, let your water that you've drawn off your tap stand for 24 hours before using. The chlorine will evaporate or dissipate from the water and then it will not interfere with fermentation. So there's a couple of simple steps related to water. And last up, vinegar. Again, why do we add vinegar? The USDA research-based um, tested fermented pickle recipes calls for the addition of a small amount of vinegar into the brine. And again, this is pretty, we can think of it as a, a safety net, um, helping us to prevent the growth of molds, bacteria, and yeast during that initial phase of fermentation when we may not have enough natural lactic acid present uh, to lower the pH to that safe level. So um, next up, and also we wanna talk about an issue this year with vinegar, and that is that um, you wanna make sure and look for 5% acidity, which you can see on this label circled, and um, don't use any homemade vinegars as the acidity may vary and may not create a safe final product. White vinegar is typically the default vinegar that's used in a fermented pickle, but you can use any type of vinegar you like as long as it's 5% acidity. 
So again, this year we have had some reports of vinegar being spotted on store shelves that um, has a 4% acidity listed on the label. That would be too low um, for any of your food preservation uh, recipes that you're following. They are all standardized to a 5% acidity vinegar. So please make sure and double check that you are using a 5% vinegar this year um, and read the label before you leave the store. The last ingredient in the um, fermenting brine are those spices, those classic flavors that are gonna come into your product and <clears throat> provide the flavor. So they are safe to leave out. I wouldn't choose to do that. Or you can substitute to your liking. You may prefer a, a, a more garlic fermented pickle. You may be like my husband who likes a really spicy pickle. So I add a little extra crushed red pepper. Um, so you can really let your flavor preference be the guide around um, using your spices. You can get very creative. Um, some of our typical spices that I think of garlic, dill, of course, um, cinnamon sticks, bay leaves, chili peppers, peppercorns, whole yellow mustard seeds or any other colored mustard seeds, fennel seeds, allspice, cloves, coriander, and even celery seeds can add a nice um, additional flavor profile to your pickles. Typically, we use a whole dried or fresh spices are recommended because if we get into the ground spices, they can oftentimes make your brine look cloudy and they can be confusing to the eye and you may think that that is a sign of spoilage. So again, stick to those whole spices and you will uh, be all set and not confused. Another topic of course to address is um, cucumber varieties. So when we go ahead and select our cucumbers, we wanna make sure and choose the best um, product available from a quality standpoint so that we end up with a successful product. And typically um, those are cucumbers that are three to five inches in length. Larger cucumbers, we've all seen these. They're the ones that get away from us in the garden. Um, we lift up a leaf and there they are, larger than life. They can be bitter, they can be hollow. They can have a large seed cavity and they ultimately don't result in a, a, a high quality pickle. And if you're putting all this effort into it, we wanna have the best uh, end result we can. Uh, additionally, in the world of cucumbers, we wanna talk about using a pickling cucumber variety. So uh, we've got some cucumber varieties shown in the picture on the slide, and it is the pickling cucumbers that you wanna make sure and and use. So those may be known by names such as Kirby, Citadel, Premier, Bounty, Score, Calypso. These are the cucumbers that are the pickling variety. They have thicker skins, less water in the flesh, and also a smaller seed cavity, which will give us a nice crunchy pickle that we're looking for. There are of course, non-pickling varieties of cucumbers that are commonly labeled as European, English, salad, or slicing varieties. And um, as I started out with, these fall into the non-pickling category. These are the ones that we do not wanna use because they are not going to end up with a high quality pickle in the long run. So avoid those at all costs and stick to the pickling variety. We also, um, burpless is another thing that you may see on, um, that are sold. Those are not pickling varieties. So stick to the pickling ones and you'll be um, headed out of the gate in the correct direction. So next up, let's talk about the anatomy of a cucumber. So a tip to help maintain crunch in your fermented pickle is to prepare your cucumbers properly by cutting off the blossom end. Be sure to remove just a slight 1 16th of the blossom end of fresh cucumbers. These blossom ends contain an enzyme which causes excessive softening of pickles. 
So get that out of there because you don't want to end up with a soft pickle. How do you know the blossom end from the stem end? The blossom end is the one that's opposite the stem end. And you slice that off to help prevent the softening from occurring. If the stem is missing, look for the lighter shade of the pickle. That is the blossom end. And in the slide that we've shown here, you can see the pickle that's circled on the right-hand side has a little bit of brown papery substance on it. That's actually the blossom. Um, so, you know, clearly you can tell the blossom end on this one from the stem end on the one on the left, which if you look carefully, you can see the actual stem sticking out of the cucumber. Next up, the type of food grade plastic containers to use. So whatever size batch of pickles you're, or you wanna prepare, it's important to make sure that you are using a container that is considered food grade material. So that could be plastic, that can be glass, it can be ceramic, um, but also make sure that it is designed to hold food. For really large batches, you could use a five gallon bucket. This is something I have done in the past, but don't think that you can just head out to the garage and pick up a uh, old bucket that had joint compound in it, or even an old bucket that held kitty litter. Uh, those are not food grade containers and they could contain chemicals that could leach into your food. So we really want to avoid um, using any type of container that is not food grade. And these food grade plastic buckets could come from beer and wine brewing supply stores, a local deli, a bakery. Remember that a good rule of thumb is if it is a container that originally stored food, it can be safely used for food. Um, you gotta clean it out really well and needs to be sanitized. So, you know, I've heard of people bar getting frosting five gallon buckets from a deli. That's a very difficult substance to clean out of the five gallon bucket because it's, you know, so greasy. Um, so try to find a good quality food grade bucket that you can have on, keep on, you know, on supply for your pickling endeavors. Um, let's see, also look for that recycling symbol. It's a triangle with a number inside, and this can be used to determine what kind of plastic your container is. Plastic labeled one, two, four, and five are typically made to contain food. And we're going to include an additional resource for you um, at the end of our webinar with the email that we send out that will give you further instructions to help you decipher if something is in fact a food grade container. Ceramic crocs are also available and come in many different sizes. We use ours, which is shown here, to make a large batch of sauerkraut from, I've used this for anywhere from 15 to 25 pounds of cabbage. We call it the Cadillac of Crocs because it has all of the bells and whistles. It's finished with a food grade glaze. Remember that some ceramic glazes or paint products contain heavy metals and are not intended for food contact. So make sure you're checking that out before you choose to use a ceramic product. Um, this Cadillac of, of Crocs also has a channel for water um, that helps to create a um, airlock when the lid is applied. So this helps to reduce air circulation over the fermented product, which is something that we really work hard to do uh, because where there's air, there's opportunity for mold, yeast, and bacteria. This water channel and that second lid also allow for those gases that are produced during the fermentation process to escape. It's really fun to sit next to the crock and hear it bloop every once in a while as it's releasing those uh, gases. So again, we've got a couple of different steps with this product to minimize the air exposure to whatever we're fermenting. And that of course is gonna help to ultimately prevent the spoilage of our pickles. For small batches, you can use um, smaller glass jars quart size jars, half gallon or gallon sizes. 
air locks are available for these size containers and can help reduce the chances that your pickles will mold during fermentation. So that's some information about the type of container. Next, let's talk about another very important feature of fermentation, which is how to weight your product down to keep it beneath the brine. So it needs to be a weight that fits into the size of your container. The weight will help keep your vegetables fully submerged under the brine during fermentation. Again, this is a very important step since um, fermentation is anaerobic. Anaerobic means happens in the absence of air. Um, so your vegetables need to be fully submerged in the brine to properly ferment. This I've, I've run into this myself several times. Anything that is above the brine runs the risk of developing mold. So as spores from the air can land on your vegetables, again, that's opportunity for molds to form. So uh, be on the lookout for that. Make sure your product is fully submerged with one of these many different times, types of weights that are available. And um, here's a slide that's showing, um, if you catch mold developing on the surface of the brine early, you can remove it. But if it permeates through the liquid or develops onto the vegetables themselves, you should toss out the whole batch. So it's important during that fermentation process to check on your ferments daily so that you can catch any signs of spoilage early and take a corrective action. And we are now going to head into the kitchen to join Kate, who's going to first of all, talk to us about the very important um, creation of your brine solution. So Kate, take it away. Thank you, Kathy. Hello, everyone. So Kathy and I have um, been tinkering with this recipe from the National Center for Home Food Preservation. As it is written on their website, um, we found that the concentration of salt in the brine was um, on the high end of what is recommended, and it just produced a product that we found is to be too salty. So um, a safe range for your salt concentration in your brine is um, three to five percent. And when we calculated the one from the National Center for Home Food Preservation, it's actually upwards of 8% salt in that. So we it ferments, but we had just created some um, batches from that recipe and then found the pickles themselves to be too salty to enjoy. <laughs> so we've done some math here to break down um, the quantities of the recipe and then calculated the salt that's required in grams. So this is a little bit of a change from the recipe as written on the National Center for Home Food Preservation and that they give it to you in cups like the rest of the recipe, the salt requirement. So you will need a um, food scale to create your brine with a less um, saltier percentage than is written on their website. Um, so we will send you this in the follow up so that you can just follow the math or follow the recipe as written from the calculations we've done already. Um, but the one thing that you'll need that might deviate from your traditional um, home kitchen equipment is that food scale. So I think with that, um, Kathy, we can end that slideshow and I'll just do the demo. Thanks. I wanna make sure I'm spotlight. There, see myself. So I think we're good to go. You got it, good. <laughs> Um, okay, so we, Kathy went out and got um, four pounds of pickling cucumbers. And so I'm going to start by preparing the brine that is written for those um, four pounds of pickling cukes. And that's going to go and it's going to be a gallon size container. Um, so for that, we have eight cups of water. So I've got eight cups of water here. And I'm going to add um, it's 54 grams of salt. So I've got 54 grams of salt into my eight cups of water. Um, and this is a range. Again, this is going to create a 4% brine. And the range we give you um, is between three and 5%. So you can like literally measure your eight cups of water and weigh them out and then create whatever percentage brine you want of that. Or you can just, um, just measure eight cups of water and then add the salt like I'm doing. So a little bit of a range. There's some flexibility is what I'm trying to tell you. So you don't have to sweat it if it's a gram or two off. 
um, with your measurement. So because this salt is a nice fine grind, it just dissolves really easily into this um, water. So I'm just stirring it to dissolve it. And I'm gonna set that aside until we are ready for it to go over top of our cucumbers. So now I've got my nice um, big gallon sized jar here. So this is a ball branded jar that is definitely not for canning, but just made for crafting or food storage or fermenting in this case. You can use any um, size container or any type of container like Kathy reviewed. So I've got this gallon sized container that I washed really well. You wanna make sure there's no soap residue because certainly the soap will obviously ruin your product, but can prevent fermentation, even if there's just a little bit of non-detectable residue. So wash it up really well. Cleanliness is really the name of the game here. If you wanna go the full distance and sterilize the jar, that would not be unwelcome because it would just help you cut down on the chance of spoilage for your product. So I'm adding two cloves of garlic and then my spice mixture, which was dill seed, a little bit of crushed red chili flake and some pickling spice. There's dill seed in here, but I just added a little bit of extra dill to make it nice and dilly. Um, you could do fresh dill if you are gardening or see it at the for sale at the farmer's market. You can buy beautiful dill seed heads. Once the dill plant flowers, it makes those nice lacy seed heads, which we always love to add um, because they just look nice in the jar. And then I'm going to pack in the cucumbers. So to prepare these, I washed them up really well. And then I made sure to cut off the blossom ends. So I've got my little collection of blossom ends to show you here. I save them. It's really just a sliver, so that 1 16th of an inch, because you're just trying to remove where the blossom end was, those enzymes that collect around it, um, discard those so that your pickles don't get soft. And I just want to interrupt for one second and say, I have I can see both your hands in action and your face for talking. And I hope that that's what our viewers can see. Um, so that's what we've got it set at. Okay. Yeah, feel free to share in the Q&A if you don't see what we see. I see that as well. Hopefully that's the case because we like the double view. All right, so I'm just packing these in here trying to vary the size because we've got some that are larger, some that are smaller. So the small ones are nice to pack in on the sides. Here's the big ones fit across the middle of the container where it's the diameter, full diameter of the container. This is the hardest part of fermentation is getting, feeling like you've maximized the space available in your container. It's an imperfect process but if you end up with more or not enough cucumbers in the jar or more cucumbers than fit in the jar you can always start a smaller jar and prepare a second batch and have them going at the same time might be able to get everybody in here except one maybe two all right well it does kind of look like I could get more in there I'm just going to call it for the sake of not fiddling with it too much. Okay, so I've got all my cucumbers in there saved for two, so not too bad. And my salt is nice and dissolved in the brine. And I don't want to forget the vinegar, so I'm going to add that in. And again, this is just to help acidify your brine before those lactic acid begin to um, do their thing. So Kathy, correct me if I'm wrong on the timeline, but I think it's to cover you in about the first 24 hours before the um, lactic acid bacteria begin to noticeably change the pH in the brine. And so it, in the quantity we're talking, it's not gonna add that much flavor. The lactic acid is gonna be much stronger flavor than those four tablespoons of vinegar I added in the eight cups of water. And simply pouring in all the brine to cover up the cucumbers, precisely eight cups of water. I love that. And we've got a nice amount of liquid over top of the cucumbers. The way that this jar is shaped, it's got the shoulders. And so they're, they're kind of naturally holding the cucumber down above the more narrow entrance to this. But just to be safe, I'm going to add this little tiny, well, it's tiny relative to the jar, small size uh, weight, just in case cucumbers start to float during the fermentation process. Um, but they're really nice and packed in there. So it's not really, I wouldn't say it's necessary, but I'm going to do it all the same. So there, voila, packing is complete. And so now we are 
kind of anticlimactic, ready to wait. So we'll cover up the jar with a coffee filter. This is to make sure no dust or fruit flies or anything falls in there, but also allows the gases that are going to be created during fermentation to escape. You might see some advice on the internet that you can just cover it with a lid and come along every day or so and burp the gases, but we find that a little risky if you forget about it. It could cause the jar to break as the gases build up in there. I mean, to explode, it would <laughs> send pickle liquid and glass all over your kitchen. So we just like to kind of set it and forget it method. So there's not a safety concern if you do truly forget about it. But we're going to be checking on this frequently to ensure that um, there's no unwanted scum or mold forming, that every everything is in good shape. What I'm also going to do is put it on a plate, just a dinner plate here. So that way, should it overflow a little bit, it'll just go on the plate and not on our kitchen counter. So if there's any spillage. And then the last step is to cover it with a dish towel to keep help keep the light out. Protect it a little bit. Our kitchen is nice and bright and sunny here. Um, so we'll just shroud it in this little dish towel. And I will sit it out. Um, in our kitchen, which Kathy and I uh, set the programmable thermostat to be about, what do we set it at? 70 degrees in here. Um, so it's on the upper end of the temperature range for a container about this size. So I did do a big batch in preparation for this webinar that um, went bad. And I did it for, I want to say 10 days. And the last three days were over the weekend. So when it came in on a Monday, it had spoiled and had pink mold all throughout it. Um, and it looked, you know, fine when I left. So the next batch, I did a smaller batch and fermented it for one week and then put it in the fridge and it was safe. So I'll be vigilantly checking on this, probably just leave it one week um, to ensure that it does not go bad, but that it also tastes good and it's fully fermented. I want to show you my completed batch before we sign off. So this was the batch that we did in a, I think this is a half gallon size jar. So it was two pounds of cucumbers. I transferred it to this quart jar just for ease of storing in the fridge. Um, so you can see the big change. This is the one that we were photographing and putting in our slideshow. So you already saw the before and after, but you could see the big change in the, the liquid. You know, it's cloudy in a good way um, because of those that fermentation that has occurred. And then the pickles themselves have changed color to darker on the inside. You know, they, they look like a pickle. They're no longer that light cucumber uh, color, but more of a yellow pickled flavor or color. And then of course we taste tested them. So we put these in the refrigerator on Monday after starting them last Tuesday. So it's a week of fermentation um, and they're still nice and crunchy. They've got a good um, tangy flavor, great texture nice color. So we're really happy with them. So we'll do the same for about for this batch and keep an eye on it. Um, I think that's everything. How'd I do? Great. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, let me review this slide before I hand it back over to Kathy. So um, this slide helps you demo or it helps show the difference that your temperature can make. So I appreciate that we're facing some really high temperatures in Maine. We're lucky here in our offices that it's climate controlled. So we're able to just set it at 70 degrees and know that there's not going to be any uh, variation for our ferments. I appreciate the time that cucumbers are ready in Maine um, or in anywhere, wherever you're viewing us in the US, that the temperatures are much are, are hotter than that 70 degrees. That's kind of 75 degrees. That's the upper end of that. Uh, range for ideal fermentation. So just get a thermos thermometer, be aware of what your temperature is. If it does, if you have an unair air conditioned um, place that it's in, know that it might be a struggle to have a quality product. I personally, when I lived in an unair conditioned apartment, I tried it many times in that apartment and was never <laughs> able to successfully create a high quality product. They always went, um, got moldy or were mushy um, during the time that they sat out. So if it's a cooler place that they're in, it'll take longer. If it's warmer, on that 70, 75 degree end, um, they'll ferment faster. Just keep an eye on it, check on them every day. I mean, you're probably as excited about them as I am. It's fun to have a little project going. Um, so check them every day, go in there with a clean hands or fork 
and um, try it after, you know, you see fermentation happening after a few days. And if you want it to ferment longer, let it sit. If you like it the way it tastes, then, then store them in the refrigerator. But Caddy's going to tell you more about storage and even your options for canning your, your pickles. Great. And we are going to get to the Q&A box. There are quite a few questions in that box. So stay tuned. We'll uh, be fielding those in just a minute. Uh, let's talk about once your pickles are fully fermented, which um, we were able to see that change in color that had occurred, um, which was awesome. And I'm sorry, Kate, I forgot to put this slide up to talk about scum um, and mold that you were talking about towards the end of your slide, uh, your presentation. So there's the picture. And um, let's then talk about um, once your pickles are fully fermented, they should be stored in the refrigerator and eaten within four to six months. Enjoy them. Um, pickles can be also processed or canned in a boiling water bath canner or the atmospheric steam canner. And as they are an acidic product when they are fully fermented. So both of those types of um, preserving process is, are for acidic foods. So they're safe to do use with your um, fermented pickles. An alternative to the boiling water bath canner is, um, it does happen in a boiling water bath canner, but it's called a low temp pasteurization treatment. So this is a USDA approved method that um, involves heating your pickles for a longer time, but at a lower temperature in order to maintain that crispness. I've had some pretty good success using this low temp pasteurization method to end up with a nice crunchy product, um, particularly when I'm using a burner that I'm very familiar with. Um, so you know how to regulate the temperature of a large pot of water because you know the output um, for whatever type of burner you're using. It is also important to um, heat your water to the 180 to 185, and you keep it in that range for 30 minutes. So hence the need to really know the burner that you're working with. Also important is to use a thermometer to monitor that water temperature as you process it for the full, full 30 minutes so that you can be adjusting your burner as needed to maintain the 180 to 185. If it does happen to drop below 180, um, it means the pickles may not be properly processed and therefore not safe for long-term storage. So it is a bit of an art that you do need to master, but it does end up in a good high quality product and it is USDA approved. Um, so we are now going to um, take some time for the, I think we've got quite a few questions in our Q&A box and it looks to me like Kate may be else already handling some of those yes. as I talk along mm -hmm. because we are, uh, we've got about uh, seven minutes for questions. So do you see one that you'd like to field first, Kate? Oh, let me look. Um, there were several questions about the vinegar. So let's just tackle all of those as best we can about why we're using it. So um, vinegar is used in quick pickling, which is just when you use vinegar, salts, water, spices to flavor the pickles and um, either can them or store them in the refrigerator. But a small amount of vinegar is used in fermenting at the beginning of the pro or to control the potential for spoilage at the beginning of the process. Uh, fermentation will produce its own acid like vinegar, a lactic acid that creates the, a more complex and we think intriguing flavor, but a little bit of, so it's two, I added a quarter cup for a gallon size container. It's a very small amount. Um, so it's just there for safety to help reduce the odds that your fermentation will spoil. So cucumber pickles are very prone to spoilage. They're obviously available in July when it's the hottest. Um, so adding that little bit of vinegar is not for flavor, um, but to help get them over that hump so they don't spoil. And then as far as using a live vinegar, typically we avoid that, but um, I think with, as a ferment, it's fermented anyway. So Kathy, what do you think about the mother in a vinegar, like a live raw vinegar? 
So typically those aren't pasteurized, hence the mother being in there. So I would stick to a regular um, vinegar that does clearly state that it's a 5% um, acidity and that it has, um, you know, it does clearly state that it has, and I don't think our vinegars do state this, so I'm kind of hesitating to say this, but uh, when the mother's in there, I just think of it as being, um, you know, a live product and could potential have the potential for creating problems in your in your fermenting pickle jar. And I, I wanted to back up Kate and say, could you share with the audience, just remind them how much vinegar was actually in that eight cups of brine that you poured over your gallon of uh, cukes? Yes, and I'm gonna just double check. I added a quarter cup. So right, so it's just cubes. a small amount. And somebody asked, what was the covering? And that was a cough, that was a paper coffee filter and a rubber band just to hold it in place. Yeah. Um, uh, somebody asked if they could do pickle spiel, spears instead of whole pickles. And, and you can. The problem with that is you break into the seed cavity and you may end up with some floating seeds. I like to keep the pickle whole. Um, and slice it later. Keeping the pickle whole also helps me to see um, if occasionally if I slice into one, how well the brine is um, getting into the, the skin, the flesh of the pickle for flavor standpoint. Someone also asked about why white vinegar is recommended. And that's just because it's the most neutral flavor. You could use apple cider vinegar. I wouldn't use any other, like I wouldn't use a balsamic vinegar. That's certainly going to have a really pronounced flavor. I mean, unless you're into it, <laughs> try and report back. <laughs> but we just recommend the white vinegar because um, it's a giant jug that's inexpensive that most people have in their homes. But that the important thing about it is that 5% acidity for safety. Everything else is just a flavor preference. So I can tackle the question about well water. So as someone who lived in a, a village for a while and had access to our public water supply and am now transitioning to well water, um, it certainly is um, a change for me. And I would encourage you to remember what the recommendations are for using well water, which are to have your well water tested each year. So um, if you're on a well water system and you are having it treated for high manganese, um, I would encourage you to do the method that we talked about, which was to bring that water to a boil for 15 minutes and then let it set for 24 hours and see what settles out of it. Um, another alternative would be to purchase some um, spring, you know, gallons of spring water to work with. If you're, you know, if you, if you question that your water could be a, a source for issues in pickling. Mm -hmm. How are we doing? We got, we've got a question about weights that were used to cover cucumbers. So we can talk a little bit about that. We've, you know, Kate and I, in the years of preserving have certainly seen um, some had some successes with weights. And then if you want to, do you have those? Um, yeah. Porous. Yeah. So hold those them. up. So we have these porous weights that came with what we refer to as our Cadillac croc. And, you know, we loved it. We thought it was great. But as it was used over time, those porous, unfinished weights that Kate is gathering did start to develop some black mold on them. And, you know, it's just because they're, they're porous and they're unfinished. So we do not use those anymore. And we fortunately have been able, so there's the porous ones that Kate's, um, let me see, shall I spotlight you? <laughs> we, bought, we bought these, but glass. So and then we purchased the glass ones, yeah, and have been very happy with the glass ones because they're easy to keep clean. They're not porous. Yeah, that's the only thing about the Cadillac that we didn't like. 
everything else we're really happy with but these unfinished ceramic ones we just felt like yeah they were carrying spoilage organisms over from one batch to another yeah Get molding so so since we switched to the glass ones yeah so if we have any other unfinished questions we'll make sure to address those but we want to end on time and point you in the direction of what those recommended resources are that you'll be receiving after the webinar and we get those out usually the same day if not within 48 hours so stay tuned for these recommended resources coming your way and we want you to know that next month we are going to be talking about canning salsa safely so please plan to join us on august 31st for this webinar and we will also be sharing a link to an evaluation that we hope you'll take the time to fill out we love getting your feedback and love to hear more about what we could do to help meet your home food preservation needs so please complete the evaluation and provide us with your u.s mailing address and we'll send you um, a free headspace tool which is used when canning and we will also be entering your name into a raffle to uh, receive a $20 Hannaford gift card. So we know people sometimes join us from other parts of the country. You may not have a Hannaford near you, but um, here in Maine, that's one of the stores that, uh, that uh, is frequented by folks. So could win a $20 Hannaford gift card. So we are at our time limit. So we wanna say thank you for joining us. And we hope you gained some good information on how to safely ferment your um, foods, including cucumbers at home. So bye, bye from me and bye from the demo kitchen. Thanks.